something that happened at a rook and Johnny, you know, flicked out at me and then I grabbed him and we were on the ground and then at one stage I was we were like a bit of handbags and then at one stage I was kinda of like this, pulling back to to throw him a dig and I was got, like, do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Along with all the other tens in the Give country. Give him what you got. But um <laughs> House of Rugby Ireland, here on Joe. Game changed. Hello and welcome to House of Rugby here on Joe. I'm Emer Constein and I'm joined in studio for the first time in a long time by Ian Madigan and Fergus McFadden. Great to have the band back together. I don't think we've actually been here in studio since the very first um, practice run. I hope we've got a little bit better since then. Yeah, hopefully, yeah. No, it's good to have all three of us in the studio together, so looking forward to the show. Absolutely. Speaking about band being back together and bands, um, what about Craig Casey's first cap song yesterday? It's, it's doing the rounds on Twitter. Tonight the music seems so loud I wish that we could lose this crowd Maybe it's better this way We hurt each other with the things we want to say We could have been so good together we could have had this dance forever, but I want to stay, please stay. Very impressive. Um, thinking back to my first cap, I think I was nearly more nervous about singing the song. It's not something that I would have been particularly comfortable with doing than actually playing the game. But um, now, look, it's an important part of kind of rugby tradition that you get up there and in front of the team. And I think the idea of it is to make a bit of a fool out of yourself. But when you nail it as well as he does, it's, you know, it's, it's a great way of, of um, introducing yourself to the team on, on the softer side of things. Was yours at that high standard? Absolutely not. I hacked my way through. <laughs> Do you, <laughs> you remember know, what you sang? Try, trying to bring the chorus in as quickly as possible and let them take over. Um, I actually can't even remember. Mountain yeah. high, I think it was. Did you win the game? It always helps when the team are on a high. Um, we actually, we drew to France. So, you know, it was kind of mixed emotions, but I was yeah. obviously delighted to get my first cap and market with a song. I didn't have to sing with Ireland, <coughs> I didn't have to sing it with Leinster, I sang Fresh Prince of Bel Air, which was grand. Didn't know all the words and it, it was fine. But with Ireland, that tradition wasn't I think it hasn't always been there. And I, I the, um it was over in Italy when I got my first cap and It's more just kissing French fellas. Yeah. Well, Drico, <laughs> Drico, Drico was um so the the captains obviously do a speech, it was over in Italy and there was an after match function. And uh, he just, you know, talked about their team and they played well. Thanks for it. And they, he handed over ties and stuff. Then towards the end, he said, oh, our first cap today, Fergus McFadden is going to come up and say a speech. <laughs> so, like, you know, which I wasn't prepared for at all. So I go up and uh, said a speech and it was fine. Thankfully, he didn't have to sing. Oh, my God. Voice. And did he just do that that day just because it was you? Like, he just did it in yeah. spite, yeah. So. What did you even say? Oh, I think I just waffled on a yeah, bit thanks performance. Thanks to my man. Just, yeah, great stadium and great experience and all that kind of stuff. That's you actually okay. find with singing those songs, like the more light the person is who's singing the song, the more the, like, the team will get behind them, get the chorus going. Mm. Whereas, you know, if it's someone who you're not too keen on, you'll have to let them <laughs> <laughs> start and burn. Just log it out. Crash and burn just stew. Yeah. Like <laughs> Wait for the chorus to come and not yeah. even join in. Nothing. That's a good. Um, a little later in the show, we will be joined by Ospreys and Wales centre Scott Williams to look back on that mad game between Wales and England and to talk about Wales going for another Grand Slam. But first, Ian, you've just come fresh after, fresh off shock tactics with Fergus there. And last week we threw you under the bus to talking about your shorts. Um, Alex well, Good. You <laughs> don't, don't bring me into this. He's getting slated by the two of us here. Um, uh, Alex Good described the colourful experience of rooming with Gavin Henson on House Rugby UK and how he used to get his match day shorts actually taken in by his tailor every week. Did that give you inspiration <laughs> for those shorts? What I do is I go to the, the club, you know, the club shop, I get the under 12 boys. <laughs> <laughs> then you stuff a pair of uh, socks down your boxes. <laughs> They're only too small if they don't go on. <laughs> that was your caption, wasn't it? He obviously got some slagging about it. Yeah, big time, yeah. yeah. You can't get away with anything. No, no, but if you're not getting slagged, you're yeah. not liked. So, yeah. It's true, nah, it's they tell you anyway. Just, as long as you give yeah. it back. 
<laughs> we'll also have a chat about the Six Nations having to postpone France versus Scotland, how it could affect the competition and Joey Carberry's Munster comeback. But first, Italy 10, Ireland 48. Ireland ran in six tries against Italy on Saturday and had three more ruled out. A couple of players continued their good form while a handful of others have staked a claim for that Scotland game in two weeks' time. So we'll start off by acknowledging it was against, against Italy, but it definitely was a better performance than the French game. Oh, I thought it was a really good performance, really encouraging. I, I thought all 23 players played brilliantly. Um, I thought the, the, some of the guys they brought in were outstanding, you know, and the back row particularly for Ireland was just unplayable from Italy's perspective, whether the Italians were getting hit by, behind the gain line by them or else if they got over the gain line, they were a tiny bit exposed. You had CJ Stander, Will Connors, and Tyg Byrne just straight over the ball. I'm not sure how many turnovers we had in the ground, but it was so impressive. Uh, Robbie Henshaw again, and you know, ir ironically, I don't think that many people have talked about Robbie that much. But he, I think he's been Ireland's. You know, I know Tyg Byrne has got man of the matches and and deservedly so. But Robbie has just been brilliant. Uh, he had another outstanding game. So yeah, really encouraging for the guy, for the lads, and um, nice to see you know them offloading the ball. And I think. They were kind of getting uh, a little bit of stick about not offloading the ball. And I think people probably forget that, you know, against a very tough Welsh and French side, um, offloading is sometimes can be a big risk. And I think they took those opportunities well and, and finished the tries when they got in behind them. Yeah, it's good to see the, the change up the game, the, the gameplay and the game plan. They, you know, they had been getting a lot of criticism last week in the media about having a lack of attack plan. And, you know, at the end of the day, scoring tries is what wins games and there was a lot of tries scored and also a lot of tries disallowed. What did you make of, I suppose, ones that were scored and the disallowed ones also? Yeah, like Ireland could have gone out at the weekend and just bludgeoned Italy and they would have they would have won playing that way. <coughs> but when they were to come up against England or, or Scotland, they wouldn't have been able to replicate that same game plan and win with ease. But I think the good thing that we saw at the weekend was the style of play that they used to beat Italy is something that you can really build on and really grow. Um, you know the interaction between the backs and the forwards was the best that I've seen um, the ability to keep moving the point of contact and you know as, as you touched on there Ferg like we got some great turnovers in our own half which then gave us field position to then impose our you know our game plan on, on Italy um, so no look it, it was really positive from from an attacking point of view and um, I suppose with the with the disallowed tries I think two of them are probably clear cut knock ons you know, I don't think we could have had too much of an issue with. with I didn't think the Henderson one was a knock on. No, Henderson one was should have yeah, been a so try. I definitely thought yeah. that was a try. Now it was yeah. unusual for the TMO not to pick that up. It was a bit odd actually how it didn't, it didn't go even back. go back at all. Yeah. Mm. It was very final with his decision. I think that was one theme of the weekend across the board. Was you know the the friend, the referees calls. You know Owen Farrell was having no look with the re John, referee. Johnny Sexton was having no look with the referee. They were clear cutting their decisions. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. I think um, you you think when the TMO is there that they're not going to get that decision wrong. Like, and obviously it didn't cost Ireland because we beat them by fifty or whatever forty points or so. But in a tighter match, like that's a shocking decision from the TMO. So um, I was surprised that one um, slipped through the net. Yeah, mm. the English Wales one, like there were some crazy calls in that. Like the one, you know, Pascal letting the um, the knock letting on. bigger take the. No, well, the knock-on was one, but the, the big one for me was letting Bigger take that quick tap, you know, or the, the quick cross-field kick. You know, you, at the end of the day, you've asked your, your captain to talk to your team. You know, the game is paused. There has to be some sort of interaction back going, are you ready to go again? Um, you know, and it wasn't like he was just lining up a kick to touch. He's lining up to try and catch the team out. You need to have, you know, there needs to be a relationship there between players and referees if they're asking to go talk to the team you need to have an agreement that you can't let play go ahead until you've given them a kind of a nod or a thumbs up that we're ready to go again. Like that's pretty basic for me. Yeah, like there's a break in play, you've got water carriers, medics on the field. Mm. Like if they if they quick tap and go there, you mm. know, you've got medics and 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 you know, water boys in the way of fully in the way of other players. So I, th I thought that was a really poor decision. Um we're not going to cry about it though. Seeing England <laughs> no, get beaten, to be honest, yeah. but I'd say they feel pretty hard done. As, as a winger, what did you think of the knock-on one? Did you like losing the ball forward, but it not going forward off you know the last bit of your body that it hits? Yeah, I think 
I would call that a knock on. Like when I know it hit his leg, but the ball hits his hand and it definitely goes forward, and he'd lost control of the ball when he was trying to 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 catch it, re sam it. So, um, I thought that was also a poor decision mm. from the referee. But it's at the, at the end of the day, like. It, it just shows, I think, to anyone out there that is still playing rugby or youngsters that are listening, like to literally play until the whistle is blown. And I think an awful lot of professional teams do that in training, but it just shows like Liam Williams did so well to finish that yeah. as well. Like a lot of other guys would have just stopped because it, like, it really was a point blank, blank knock on, but they got the rub of the green with the decision and um, just a really crucial try in, in the makeup kind of of the game, really. Some people were saying Reece Amit was so fast that he uh, outran his knock-on and everything. Um, but at the end of the day, as you said, he lost control of the ball. Um, but even his reaction, like when they showed mm. his reaction in slow-mo when he was really surprised that they gave it. Like it was, he himself obviously thought it was a knock-on. I know, yeah. Um, for the one even in the second half where I think it was bigger intercepted and kicked it through at the close to the end, at the speed of yeah. Reece Amit. To, to like, it literally looked like it was a cheetah running alongside yeah. one of the English guys there, and uh, ball just didn't bounce up from. But yeah, he's lightning, really yeah, good player. Really, really is. Following the game, Johnny Sexton spoke about Robbie Henshaw's importance to the team and compared Craig Casey to Jonathan Wilkinson. But here is here he is giving producer Pat grief for talking about Munster players again. Pat, always you come always come back to the Munster players as usual. Um, yeah, Tyg was excellent as well. Um, he was, he's been outstanding for, for the, the last three weeks. Um, I think his, his work at line out, his work at breakdown, um, but he's improved. He, he's, he's improved massively from, you know, the, the end of, you know, November when, when we were last together and he's, he's become, you know, a, a proper leader in that pack and, and helping out the guys at line out. And yeah, I can't speak highly enough about, about him as, as well. They were, I suppose he was outstanding too. Yeah, uh, Will Connors. You know what you're going to get with Will. Um, the energy that he brings, you know, obviously his chop tackles and 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 his, you know, working around the breakdown. But you know, he, he he's a brilliant ball player as well, which we probably haven't seen enough of. Um, but I saw. I think we saw it at glimpses tonight, obviously. Um, and yeah, he he was outstanding. But I think you you can look across the park, and I think everyone. Everyone stood up today, and everyone was was pretty good because they're they're a really well coached team, Italy. Um, and sometimes we say during the week about the respect that they deserve and, and the standard rugby they've been playing. Um, and I think that was the case. I think they they stretched us at times. And like I said, any team I've ever played against uh, under Franco Smith have tested us, um, whether it was a Treviso or or Italy and. Uh, he, he's, he seems to be an outstanding coach and gets his team playing uh, and challenging the opposition and, and I'm sure they'll learn a lot from today. Perfect. Thank you, Johnny. Thanks. Johnny, did that performance come out of frustration or just was it a case of being patient and he's got to where he's wanted to get in the last few weeks? Um, a little bit of both. Like, if you think about the Wales game, um, like, we played the game with 14 men, so, you know, we, we would have, we like to we think that we would have played like that in that game. We were a bit frustrated after the French game in terms of the things that we had talked about during the week we didn't deliver on um, and the things that we were, were told during the week we didn't, we didn't uh, deliver on. And that was the frustrating part. And, and we probably look back with regret in terms of, you know, we didn't play to our potential and we didn't execute the game plan as, as best we could. So each, each game has been different. And I suppose today was accumulation of of boat weeks and, and it coming together a little bit, but it doesn't mean everything's fixed now. We got to keep improving, and um, obviously a massive test ahead. Um, you know, going to Murrayfield, it's it's always an incredibly tough game, and then a six-day turnaround into England. So it's uh, it's still all all to do. You know, we can we can if we get a couple of results in our last couple of games, it'll be an okay championship. Um, it, it'll be one that you know what might have been. Um, but you know we want to finish on a high. That's what we said after the French game. We've come in for some flack over over the last few weeks, but internally as a group, I don't think we've ever been more confident about where we're going and where what we can produce. And and I mean that properly. That um, 
with the coaches that we have, with the, the leadership group coming out of their, their shells and, and, and improving their leadership, I think that this group is, is on the right track trajectory and, and I, I properly believe that and um, those two guys are going to play a huge part like their character like Craig Casey I, I, I didn't know him that well obviously because I didn't, I've never played with him but his attitude is I don't think I've ever come across anyone um, it kind of reminds me of, of what I read about Johnny Wilkinson really was that's the only person I can relate it to and it's uh, it's inspiring for the for the rest of the group for someone like me even at this stage of my career I like to be last off the pitch, and uh, I'm never last off the pitch now with him around. So, um, no, he's been brilliant, and and Ryan was outstanding when he came on. He's got that energy and incredible athlete. So, uh, yeah, the future is bright with those two leading the charge. So, on Sexton himself, he generated some headlines before the game by suggesting he could finish up before the next World Cup. For you know him inside out, I'm sure you do too, Ian. He was said often said that he's he's like having a second head coach there as a player. Has he ever disciplined you there as a player? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we've had plenty of fisty cups over the years on the pitch, and yeah, he's, he's one of my, my he'd be Johnny. We one of my best friends. Lucky enough to gotten had some great memories playing together, but we're we're really top mates off the field as well. Um, so once you cross the whitewash and stuff happens in training, I think Johnny's just one of those guys that is constantly driving the standards and even when he broke through into Leinster um, you know the likes of him along with the Cheka they probably broke the culture in Leinster and brought it to a new level um, and you know he's still doing that now with Ireland and Leinster and you know for Stuart Lancaster and Andy Farrell to have someone like him there with his knowledge and the way you know you know, players respect him so much that are around him. Um, you know, younger guys that come into th the environments and see the way he carries himself on and off the pitch. Um, you know, it's 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 great. What did you scrap of it? <laughs> Had a couple of scraps now. <laughs> yeah, a couple of scraps. A few days we weren't talking afterwards, but we always have to kiss and make up in front of the lads. Um, oh, I can't remember. To be honest, there was, there was so a, many of them. There was quite a few of them. Part of it is there when was. You're, yeah, when we're you're both fiery training, people, though. Yeah, and, when and you're in training, it, like you want to have competitiveness you know between whether it's the first against the seconds or even if it's just a training drill you need to have that competitiveness and a lot of the time the reality is you're trading a very fine line between pushing it too far or also just having really good healthy competitiveness and you know the reality was that that happened quite a bit um and you know <laughs> there'd always be a bit of an inquiry into who was actually at fault when it went too far but you know very quickly, like after the heat of the moment has passed, you know, you, you get over it and as, as Ferg said, you kiss and make up and you, you, you get on with it. But that's the culture that you're looking to, to drive in both, you know, provincial and, and with, the, with, the, uh, with the Irish team. I remember in 2018, there was like, the Bibs were training against the first, but before a French game. And, um, you know, the Bibs were obviously trying to break into the 23. The team hadn't fully been picked yet. And I can't remember, something happened in a ruck and the bibs had been playing quite well against the, the the starters, you know, and and we all know that whether you're a starter or a bib, you know, in those big weeks, it, it gets very competitive. And something happened at a rook, and Johnny, you know, flicked out at me, and then I grabbed him, and we were on the ground. And then at one stage, I was we were like a bit of handbags, and then at one stage, I was kind of like this, pulling back to to throw him a dig. And I was got, like, do it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> on with all the other tens in the Give country. Give him what you got. But um. <laughs> Yeah, when I pulled back, then we got pulled off each other. But um, yeah, I'd say now if I did hit him and do a bit of damage, I'd say I never would have been seen again. Although I wasn't in camp for that much longer. <laughs> <laughs> Could have been the reason. Yeah, that was it. <laughs> <laughs> um, go back to the game of the weekend. Tyg Brown got the official man of the match. He played at blindside instead of, I suppose, in the second row. He, does that add another dimension to his game, I suppose? It gets him out there quicker off the back of his scrum to work in the breakdown, to be the nuisance that he is? Or, you know, what do you think, where do you think he's he's most suited? Yeah, he's a big engine type, you know, and sometimes you see with guys who are playing at six and then they go into the second row and you just don't see them as much. Um, with him going from the second row into six, he's he's got more energy because he's obviously not having to push yeah. as hard in the scrum. He's not tied up as much in the line out. Um, but yeah, he ad he adds a huge amount to the Irish um, team because going into games now, he's someone you're going to have to scout really closely. Anytime he's near a breakdown or CJ's near a breakdown or Will Connors or, or 
you know, you're thinking there's going to be a turnover. And, like, their hit rate for getting turnovers between the three of them was phenomenal in the, in, in the Italian game. And it's been really good all season. Um, big thing for Tyg as well, he's added the kind of carry game, which we mightn't have seen as much in previous seasons. I know he was incredibly good for, for the Scarlets when he was over with them, but we haven't seen that running game. That's something that he's really brought in. We saw him on the edge a few times and, you know, with his pace and power, when you get get the ball to him with a bit of bit of space, he's he's very dangerous. And you now he's he's certainly added a, a huge amount both attacking and defensively. Craig, Casey, and Ryan Baird, obviously the main talking points of the first caps of the weekend. Um, Ryan Baird just seems to be some sort of a, like supersonic athlete. He's just so athletic. And Craig Casey, obviously, we spoke about his energy that he always brings. But what was Ryan like as a player with, when you were with him in Leinster? Yeah, I think straight away from the first few training sessions, you probably everyone knew that he was a special talent. Um, so quick, like literally. Does like, he have a background in athletics? I'm I'm not sure to be honest with you. I'd imagine he probably does because he's he's as quick as most of the back threes when he gets up to top speed, and it doesn't take him very long. Did um, you see the picture of their first caps? Yeah, it's brilliant. <laughs> Quite crazy up to his hip, like he literally yeah. looks like a mascot. <laughs> <I know. laughs> Hilarious. Even the way he's wearing the hat, like those hat caps are absolutely brilliant. I love yeah. them. You know the way his hair is; it's just kind of sat on top of it, like. There goes. But yeah, Ryan is yeah brilliant talent. I think he's going to have a long, long career with Ireland. Um, and I think you know, he fits the mold of that new second row now. Um, that all the best teams have that hybrid second second row that's almost like a back row. They have the same attributes athletically, but they're <coughs> tall enough to be in the second row. So. You know the 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 um the strength and depth in that position in in Ireland is probably the best it's ever been. Um, so I think you know going into the rest of the Six Nations, it's going to be interesting to see uh, how selection goes in that area. I always loved going to Italy. You know the food, the post match function is always one of the better ones. Even though you haven't a word of Italian, they haven't a word of English, but it's always really good. Um, I'm sure the lads would have enjoyed probably a bit of team bonding after that night but was there any did you ever have any memorable moments against our nights out in Rome or against the Italians in, in either I suppose Dublin or I suppose any memorable nights out afterwards where you know the, the team kind of bonded and the importance of those bonding nights yeah um, I think same same I'd be I'd agree with you on that the, the, the spread over there and the food wise was, was yeah. unbelievable always um, <laughs> and yeah <laughs> It was always great. Um, generally, you came away with the win, which was always nice. Uh, but no, it didn't, didn't mix with the Italians, actually. They were the, probably the one nation I never really got to know. Um, knew Ian McKinley, obviously. Yeah. I had played with him in UCD before he, he moved over. But not really, being honest, no. I, I, I didn't really mix with the Italians a whole lot. How about you? Yeah, I, I was a member of the team in 2013. We managed to lose over there. And that after... It was kind of the wheels had come off when Decky was um, coach and subsequently moved on. But yeah, it was wasn't a great trip to be on that one. You know, like mm. that's not a place you want to go and 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 lose a game. Um, and and it was the end of the Six Nations as well. So you know, we fell really flat off the back of what looked like it was going to be really promising, having beaten Wales in the first game of the, of, of the competition. But um, yeah, not 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 too many fond memories from that night. Was there any player that you played with that you know you didn't really like that much? I suppose through the provinces, but then actually ended up going on a night out with them, apart from uh, Paul O'Connell with you. But it was going on a night out with them and actually you know, but like oh they're actually sound. You know you didn't really know them until you actually had that night out during Six Nations. I think the vast majority of guys that you you go into camp and you haven't met before from the other provinces, like <coughs> most guys would say, like they'd want to be pretty disliked for you not to get on with them yeah. you know like uh, um, but personally probably like the likes of Jerry Flannery and Andrew Trimble probably when I was first playing them and I'd, I'd never you know talked them off the field before um, but then when I was in Irish camp with them got on great with them um, you know just really good team guys the type of guys you would hate you know yeah, you hate to play them. against but it's often those guys are the best guys in the change room as well and, and they're definitely two good examples yeah, I know someone like Lindsay Peet, I'm not sure if you know her, but she plays for Leinster in Ireland and I would have played against her 
as a Dublin, as a Clare footballer, her playing for Dublin, and she was just one of those people playing against them. You just, she like revs everyone up, like really gets in your face. Even now, like even, you know, a train today, like she's just always, you know, revving right up to the next level. And it's until you actually get to know someone like her that you're like, from a distance as an opposition player, you hate playing against them, but actually, you know, it's much better to be on their team and you really get to know the person. But there are so many people that I think sport just does that and they're like different people off the field, off the field. completely different people off yeah. the field. Yeah, Zebo was like that for me. He was a year younger than me coming through the age grades and, you know, there was a lot of hype around him and um, whenever we were playing against Munster in the, you know, the earlier days, he'd be mouthing off and he'd be going, you know, I hate that guy, like he's driving me up the wall. Um, but then once you get into camp and you kind of see the softer side and see how much you know fun he has, whether it's in the gym or or on the field and in, in training sessions, you, you you kind of warm to them and um, I think you see the value of them as players as well. It's it's very different when you're playing with them as opposed to scouting them and, and coming up and competing against them. What about those away games? Was there any roommate in your that you like? They were estranged to room with, or they were like an awful roommate, or they were just they did something any like strange quirks that you know funny stories from roommates. I always had the same roommate because um, me and Sean Cronin always roomed together uh, with Leinster on the away trips. And then with Ireland, yeah, if we were in the squad, we generally roomed together as well. But like in Is hindsight, that by choice? Like, uh, well, we were, would have been we were re, real, really tight mates. So yeah, like. It was it was ideal, but the thing the thing about Sean the night before a match is that, like, if you don't get to sleep before him, you're for gonna struggle to get a night's sleep because he literally snores like a <laughs> horse that's getting strangled to death. Like, <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, also, like, if you if you arrive at the hotel, drop your bags off, go down, and then come back up for after a bit of grub, and you're settling in for the night, it would it looked like it would look like someone's ransacked the room. Like, there's literally, there could be a boot in the sink, there could be this there, toothbrush underneath his bed. And you still chose to room with him all those times? Ah, uh, yeah. you got to stick, you got to stick by each other. Um, but, yeah, him for me, he was, he was the one. So I'm actually, looking back on my career, I'm like, I should have got paid more money because <laughs> I, I'm not sure anyone else would have been signing up for that. Like, you know. <laughs> Full-time counselor for him. Um, yeah, I used to room with Lukey Fitz a lot and, you know, similar to, to Ferg and, and, and Sean, you know, you build a, a special relationship. Obviously, you're enjoying the good times, but there's obviously the serious side to it as well. Leading into a game, you're good and nervous. You kind of have that special bond with your roommate who can kind of quell your nerves. But, um, yeah, I remember back in the 2015 World Cup, I was rooming with Lukey and um, Rory McIlroy came in as a guest and we went up and we're on the dri driving range with him and I'm sure plenty of people have seen the video but Lukey was offered by Rory to take a shot, got up and like Lukey in fairness to him is actually a great golfer but for whatever reason between his like groin injury and his neck problem he hadn't swung a golf club for like two years but <laughs> you know Luke, it's pretty intimidating in yeah. Luke, all, Luke, all, Luke, the all the lads <laughs> dying for you yeah. to anyone to else it. anyone else would have gone, <coughs> right I'll just knock it down you know 75% hit a drive 250 I'll be happy out Lukey was thinking I'm going to grip and rip and show Rory what I've got here and obviously made a complete mess of it topped it let go of the club but we went back to the room and um the video was put out and like went viral pretty quickly. Like, so I he broke the club, didn't he? What? Did he not break Larry's club? Didn't he? <laughs> yeah, was... Heard the top of his driver came <laughs> off. <laughs> He's handling it back. The thing is rattling, like. You know? yeah. But I managed to convince Lukey to um, to go in front of the mirror and make it look like he was doing practice swings and like that. Rory had you know trying to remember the tips that Rory had given him. And I'd set up and, and, and taken a camera, you know, camera angle of it. And it's fun stuff like that that you have with your roommate that he's willing to kind of, you know, sell a, sell a, bit, of him. <laughs> <laughs> sell a bit of himself for a good laugh. And, I'm, you know, I'm sure he got me back pretty soon after it. Yeah, I remember that. That was a funny story, right? Um, before we get to Scott, before we get Scott Williams on the phone, I wanted to... Are you have any good ones yourself? Yeah. Oh, I love this one, like, <laughs> when you're presenting. It's like, yeah, you tell me this, tell me that, tell me tell your darkest Tell me all the juicy secrets, bits. I'm not going to tell you any mine. Like, what, surely you've had a couple of roommates. Yeah, like, we be. actually didn't, like, we change up every single week, so you always have someone new. Like, there's never, like, you never... You very rarely get some like you don't have that many away trips as it, for the women. You know we probably have two or three. Uh, surely um, one of the girls is a bit smellier or something like that. <laughs> we um, 
I was thinking about this and I was like, what's, you know, what's appropriate to say? Um, and uh, I actually think of Ailsa Hughes, she'll, she'll kill me for this, but she, um, she goes around the room in her underwear 99% of the time because she's either moisturising herself or tanning herself. And she's either waiting for it to dry or there's or something. But it's Sounds like, like my room. Like <laughs> <laughs> His only wish, no good to do that in my room. Where's the hair dryer on her? <laughs> the tan, is it? You're using her new new products. Yeah, so I was just thinking she's probably one of the, the other ones. But then I remember remember rooming very early on in my career and I was like new to the squad and you know, I was there at my protein bars and, you know, really healthy snacks for the for the tea in the afternoon and I was rooming with one of the older um props and in she comes with like a full box of donuts and I was like oh my god and then she's like props are the best roommates to have and I was like okay this is this is good but like thank god I didn't okay so let's take a guess <laughs> to the props um, they're gone so. they're well they're gone they're retired so I'm not even going to oh, name so names was, <laughs> please is stop her just please Fiona, stop Fiona Coughlin then <laughs> is it it was Fiona <laughs> She's before my time. <laughs> she was before my time. Oh, but yeah, they, she won't like hearing that either. <laughs> no, she, she, she might. She might have had donuts, maybe, but it wasn't here at the time. But yeah, there's some. It's good to. I like the way we got to change it up. Obviously, like you walk in and you don't know who you're going to get, so it's kind of always a surprise that way, which is good. And you get to know people that, like, especially these days, you know, for new girls coming into the squad, it's really hard because with COVID. You know, you all room on your own, which is, I think, is amazing as well. But, you know, you you miss the crack, too, of going into each other's rooms and having, like, snacks and tea and all those things. So it's hard for the new girls in the squad, but really lucky that, like, I got to do that and mix with all the girls and have all those different roommates when I started off because you really get to know people by room with them. But um, that's enough about me. Uh, let's wrap up with some of the big Guinness Pro 14 talking points from the weekend. So Joey Carby making his Munster comeback, his first game since January 2020 as they won 2011 against the Cardiff Blues. Um, how big can that be for a Munster in Ireland? His mind's going to... Be big for a Munster. <laughs> How big from Wednesday? <laughs> I know, I'm delighted Joey's back. Um, he's a few years behind me in, in school and um, was coming through the ranks when I was in Leinster. And obviously, it's been really tough. It was a nasty kind of ankle and foot injury. So it was um, a long road back for him. But now, look, there's no doubt he'll get back to full fitness and, and start hitting form. And he can be, you know, he could be the the secret weapon that Munster have needed to unlock that back line you know it's with the likes of Delande and, and um, the Danish back three they have you know it's, it's exciting times down there they've been building over the last few years so yeah delighted to see him to see him back as well um, you know really really tough time for him with that injury um, you know because for a while people there, was n there wasn't really any clarity on how bad it was and you know you're worried, worried for the worst there for him and he's, he, he's still so young and um, but yeah, he looked in looked in great shape when he came on. You know, all his his kicking out of hand um, to touch off penalties, I thought actually was particularly good for someone who hadn't played in so long. Um, and then he knocked over that kick from the touchline. So yeah, great. just a brilliant. Um, he'll be really, really uh, great weapon for for Munster to bring in coming into the business end of the season. And also, you know, who's to say that Andy Farrell might not bring him in for the last couple of weeks just to expose him to the Irish squad as well again. Yeah, like you've obviously had your fair share of injuries yourself, but did it make his recovery easier? The fact that there wasn't a timeline put on his like return to play, like he's not going to be back in six months. <coughs> he won't be back in six months or five weeks or whatever. Like as an athlete trying to recover, is there less pressure on you without a time frame? Ooh, I, I I always like the time frame with my injuries because even if they're a really long one, you're working towards that. And once you can get over, say if it was a you know, six month injury. I did my ACL, which was a six month injury, and it's really true. You've got the operation, but literally, once you've had the operation, you know, every day from there, you're a step closer to playing. And I imagine Joey knew how long his injury was going to be, but just, you know, the media, the press, the outside world didn't have the inside. Scoop. Yeah, 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 maybe. And I think the one thing from his perspective for people outside to not have been given the clarity, and Grant, for yeah. privacy reasons, he, you know, might not wanted to have said that. But it means that every time he's gone somewhere, like, and he's outside of his family or his circle, they're going, what's the with your injury? So that can be a little bit exhausting yeah. as well. That's the, the other side of yeah. that. On the injury front up in Ulster, good to see that Stockdale and Robert Balakoon were back on the field as well. Yeah, Jacob picked up a, 
a bang against Munster and he'd been training so you know wasn't too too much of a long road back for him but um, Rob Balakin someone who we're really excited about I think he's played maybe 25 or 30 times for Ulster but just from training with him during the summer he was someone who I was really excited about getting he had a nasty injury with. didn't he yeah he did he tore his hamstring um, badly so yeah but he, he looks fully fit and, and ready to go and he's someone who could definitely play for Ireland further down the tracks he's you know extremely fast he's got great footwork he's good in the air um, and he's a brave defender you know he's um, someone who I think you know, could have come in under the radar for us at the business end of last season, and he was carving up throughout preseason. So look, it's been it's been a tough kind of seven or eight months for him, but he's back fully fit and similar to Joey from Munster, he could be our our secret weapon going yeah, forward. Yeah, there's some depth there in Ulster at the moment, especially in the back three. Like even the fact that like Jacob had been playing at full back for Ireland, but Mike Larry has been playing phenomenally. Like you can't budge him from full back, and also. You know, Balakoon on the wing, but like you've been doing pretty well in those positions. Yeah, there's great quality there. Mikey's been great. You know, one of the younger guys coming through. For, um, he's played on the wing. He's played out half a bit, and and of late he's been playing full back. He's he's got incredibly good feet, like up there with with probably Chels and Kobe. You know, he's 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 that nippy, and I think we saw that last week on on the synthetic surface. He's he's nearly unstoppable. So no, look, it's really exciting. There's there's probably seven or eight guys up there now competing for three. Um, back three spots so that's what you want you want that competitiveness in training where you've got two two strong teams going after each other and the guys who are in form will, will be the ones getting picked I suppose you're going to take a little bit of claim for Nick, Tim Nick Timoney's breakaway for uh, diving on the ball some, <laughs> some wheels in him though yeah made up for me getting blocked down at the start <laughs> of the game <laughs> yeah look, Nick is, is someone um, who's really stepped up? Obviously, Marcel's announced that he's he's moving on at the end of the season, and um, you know there's going to be an opportunity for someone to to step up there. And, and Nick has has taken it with with two hands with the opportunity he's got. He's um, he's a phenomenally good athlete. Like he's really like one of these guys whose gym scores are through the roof. For someone who's not you know huge in stature, he's very very strong. He's fast. He can interplay well with the backs, um, and he's still very young. Like he's a guy who's who's really improved a huge amount in in the the seven or eight months that I've been at the club, and we're we're really excited about where he can get to in, in Ulster. And I'm sure if he can keep this form up, like he could he could find himself in the in the Irish picture. What about Leon Nakawara coming in? We haven't actually chatted about that since that was announced. Yeah, yeah, I think he's a great signing. He's someone. Who offers something a bit different? You know, we, we've obviously played against him a few times. Fergie's, you know, his, his offloading game is outstanding. Like he's he's one of these guys who can put literally pull a rabbit out. A bit of the different hat. is an understatement there. <laughs> yeah, very different. An attack of him is yeah. You know, the way he holds the ball, you know, it's, it's very difficult. Like he's got, surely has the most offloads in in world rugby over the last yeah. like couple of years. It's uh, you know, you've got that in your side even when there is no space and you manage to flick the ball out like he does. It's just. It's um, it's a way to unlock defenses, really, as yeah. we as we've seen, and uh, yeah, he'll be massive for you. Yeah, it's very hard for defense coaches when you're coming up against someone like him because, you know, how how do you prepare for for that? Like when he flicks it out the back door, you know, you can say, oh, let's get one guy low, one guy high in him, you know, and then suddenly you send it out the back of him, and it's two of your defenders sell down the river. So, um, yeah, look, he'd be someone who we're really excited about bringing into the club, and um, I think he'd be a really good signing for us. And Connacht um, got that last minute crucial try by Bundyaki to win over Treviso at the weekend. So great stuff. We'll be right back with part two. House of Rugby Ireland, here on Joe. Game changed. Right, I think it is fair to say that before this year's championship, few would have predicted Wales would be on top of the table after three rounds. Triple Crown champions and of course on for a Grand Slam. We thought the best way to pay Wales their proper dues would be to get on proud Welshman and a guy who knows what it takes to win a Grand Slam, Ospreys and Wales centre Scott Williams. Scott, first up, you had that infamous tackle on Brian O'Driscoll back in 2012 that registered 27 Gs. Brian described it as like being in a car crash. How was it for you? Uh, yeah, the same. Uh, I think I come off second best as well, to be fair, but uh, <laughs> a little bit of regret afterwards, but happy that I made his book. <laughs> <laughs> More than we made, Scott. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> we played with him for 10 years. <laughs> yeah. 
there was a few funny tweets over him back and he didn't come out as scot-free as everyone thought, but you ended up having to have surgery after it. Yeah, I did a, a grade four AC joint. I and tore my delt off the bone. So it was, uh, yeah, it was a bit painful at the time. I was praying and after I tackled him that he was going to go off so I could go off, but he stayed on. So I had to stay on for 10 minutes and try and play. But um, in the end, I had to go off because my shoulder just felt like it was, was well, completely off. Hmm. And it absolutely was. Well, at least you made the book anyway. At least that's one, one bright light out of that. Yeah. Scott, be honest, did you see this Welsh revival coming after the performances of the Autumn Nations? Um, no, to be honest, yeah, they've, they've done well to, to get to where they are. I think there was a lot of pressure on them going into the first game in Six Nations, like you said, after, uh, you know, they're running the autumn, but no, hard on Longham and I think they were probably a little, little bit lucky against Ireland, um, but they, they did well to go, then go out to um, to Scotland to get the win, especially after you know them beating England and then uh, obviously beating England uh, yesterday. You say that with a smile on your face. Yeah, it was a very good day yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good day for us too, don't you worry. <laughs> yeah. What did you make of the big calls in yesterday's game? Obviously, Owen Farrell wasn't too impressed with the referee's decisions. No, I, I was at the game and I, I remember at the time, uh, you know, he got asked to speak to his team about their discipline and he made sure he asked the ref if, if he could have the time. And I've been in a situation before when you're captain and that's the first thing that you do. And I think he was expecting that he was going to get the time to set um, but obviously he didn't. Um, yeah, like if I was in his shoes, I, I wouldn't have been happy, but I'm not, so I'm happy. <laughs> <laughs> what about Reese Samuel? We were speaking earlier on the show about it, that he outrun his own knock-on um, controversial decision or happy as a Welshman? Uh, yeah, happy because, well, like, you know, as a rugby player, sometimes those decisions go against you and sometimes uh, they go your way. But I, I do think that it, it might have been a knock on. I think you, you can tell by, by Zamet's reaction, he thinks that he's knocked it on. But obviously the, the four, uh, you know, referees who were looking at it decided it wasn't. And um, yeah, happy that it was a try. I think we were saying earlier on that... Um... Liam Williams is finished for that try. Like I played against you plenty of times, but Liam plenty of times as well. And uh, I think that kind of sums him up as a player. You know, like a lot of other players would have given up on that, but like he kept chasing it down and uh, finished it. Um, a lot of the times I did play against Liam. Yeah, I think it, if I, you look at all the players kind of around him, wouldn't they? They they kind of just stopped, and he was the only one who who carried on really, and lucky he did. And um, what's it like though when? Like as an English point of view, for you guys as players on the field, when call after call is going against you, and like there's nothing you can do. Never has a referee, you know. Yes, they can go to TMO, but he was pretty certain with his decision, and he wasn't rechecking that. I think it's tough because it can depend. Like sometimes um, you can just feel like the tides against you big time. But you, you like I think particularly at test level, uh, the majority of the players that are that are there have. have you know, been in that boat in European matches or whatever. So you just got to ride that wave out and wait till your purple patch arrives. But um, yeah, I mean, the makeup of that game, people can argue about the, the refereeing decisions for for Wales, but I think they were well worth their their victory there. I don't think that um, England were clinical enough in what they did. Um, and uh, yeah, I was certainly delighted to see them do it anyway. Yeah, I think with referees, like you can have some referees you build a relationship with as as the game's going along. Someone like Nigel, you can interact with them, whether you're captain or not. Um, but then there's other referees that do not like being spoken to and don't want to have any conversations at all. And definitely being part of teams where you know, for someone like Roman Poit, you just leave him referee the game, and and we've said as a team, no one appeal for for anything. And you can actually win a, a, a ref over by doing that um, because it, you know the other team are obviously still going to be appealing for stuff and they can lose their patience with them. And finally yesterday, I suppose England's ill discipline let them down really um, in the game as well. You know, obviously some Welsh magic, but Maro Otoje, I think he gave away five penalties. Like that's just 
that's a stat you don't want on your stats board at the end of a match. Yeah, um, I think he, he did he did hurt them quite a bit first half. But I think also, like you say, he, he kind of lives on that fine line, you know, with the charge down and he's he's a nu- nuisance in that ruck area. And, you know, sometimes he gets those turnovers and then, you know, obviously like we saw yesterday, sometimes they go against him and it's, it's just the compounding ones that kind of that, you know, have the, the biggest effect really. You were part of the Welsh team that won a Grand Slam in 2012, which was kicked off by a win over Ireland when Stephen Ferris was yellow carded and Lee Halfpenny kicked a last minute penalty. When results, when results start going in your favour like that, do you immediately start thinking a Grand Slam is on the line? Um, I'm sure they all say that they're not thinking too much about the Grand Slam, but um, yeah, you know, you, you start building up momentum and confidence and like like you said, uh, you know, yesterday's game will be probably remembered about the decisions. But I thought Wales, you know, played um, quite well, especially towards the end of the game. You know, to to score those tries and um, yeah, they'll take a lot of confidence from that. You know, they've they've beat um, like you said some of the the best teams in the competition so far, and they'll definitely be having their eyes on on the Grand Slam now. And you can't exactly say that Wales have had standout performances, like or obviously individual performances, yes, but as a whole, they haven't, you know, they've scraped by the first three rounds, well, the first two rounds, and um, it must give them some bit of belief that they're still, they're winning games without actually performing. Yeah, exactly. Um, you know, I'd rather win a game than perform well and lose, but uh, like you said, that's, that's the plus they got to take out of it is they're probably not happy with their performances. It's not kind of been a complete performance, but they're still winning. And um, as long as they can, you know, keep building on, on, you know, what they're trying to do and, and improve in, then um, this, it's only good things to come, hopefully. Yeah, certainly. I think you touched on it there. Like when, I think in the in the Irish game and the Scottish game, they didn't play well, but they won. I actually thought Wales played really well yesterday for, for large parts of that game. Their attack looked the best I've seen them attack for, for probably a couple of years. Um, but yeah, as you said, it's much easier to find form as long as you're still winning than, you know, thinking you're 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 playing well but losing games. That can really affect your you know, the team's confidence. I think We'll see Wales continue to grow as as this competition goes on because they're you know they're the only other team outside of France that have been winning all their matches. Wales yeah. often exactly. seem to come really big in lines um, in the years of lines tours, two thousand and five, two thousand and nine, and two thousand and thirteen. Looking at it now, how many Welsh players do you think are definitely on that um, lines tour, wherever it may be? Oh, um, it's a tough question that one. Obviously, from Bach's point of view, I think George has probably been playing some of the best rugby that he's played, especially over the last couple of seasons. And um, obviously, a big day for him yesterday, winning the uh, you know hundred caps. And then you have you know Alan Wynn, who's who's probably one of the first on the list, but. I suppose winning helps and I think um, especially with Gatland you know he'll pick um, players and from teams that probably are doing better and I think it does help your position as a player if you're winning so I think you might see a few more of the Welsh boys uh, go in if they can carry on their form I think What about the Irish? Yeah the same uh, you know like you said, I think they'll be disappointed. They, I thought they might have deserved to to win that first game against Wales. We were quite lucky, but um, again, there's a lot of players in that team that are, you know world class. What do you think, Les? Who do you think is like? There's not many, I suppose, standout performances at the moment. But you mentioned Robbie Henshaw a while ago. Would he be in for contention? Well, I think so. Uh, be interested to hear what what Scott thinks as a centre. But um, yeah, I think Robbie's been you know an outstanding 12 on test and and club level now for for a couple of seasons and i think um you know i've no doubt that gatland will will bring people that he trusts and probably have been on lines towards the four robbie has but johnny davies obviously is just back from um from his injury so um 
I'm sure he'll be in the fold, but I think Robbie's been the best 12, um, you know, in, in, in Ireland and, and the UK for, for the past couple of seasons. So I, I definitely think he should be in the running for a starting spot. Yeah, I agree. Um, I said to one of the boys when I was watching the Irish game, is probably some of the best rugby I've seen uh, Robbie play. Um, I thought his all-round game, I thought, was was very good. And like you said, I think he's probably sticking his hand up for, for that position in, in the centre. You've got the obvious as well, you know, like you said, John. So there's, uh, well, and, and, you know, Ringrose as well, who I played against a few times and, you know, he's, he's very hard player to play against. So, um, yeah, some good competition there. Do you still know word on the when the Scotland versus France game will be rescheduled? But there is conflicting scheduling there with the Premiership and the Scottish players potentially not being able to be released. Yeah, I think uh, I'm not sure the game can be rescheduled for next week. I'm assuming that uh, with the rules that you know Scotland have to release their players back to the club, so they'll lose a lot of of their you know top. Uh, starting players so I, I don't think they'll be too happy if it was rescheduled for next week but saying that though like what are the chances of the French guys actually you know being all able back to play fit and healthy free from Covid a lot of close contacts I imagine I imagine there's a lot of more testing to be done this week with the French team yeah I don't know I'd say I'd imagine their S&C staff have been doing have been training because they could be asymptomatic they could have probably have been training behind closed doors mm. Um, so I'm sure they're they're staying fit, but um, I'd imagine the likes of I think Dupont definitely he got it, didn't he? Yeah. So I think there was twelve of them, wasn't there in total, or maybe even more. Yeah. yeah. So um, like they don't need those players if they want to try to win the Grand Slam. Like on the flip side, Wales have three or four players coming back from injury, you know, and they'll have another game to get under their belt before that, and um, it'll just be a funny dynamic leading it because it, you know that I think it's the last game, isn't it, Wales and, and France against each other. Like over there, that you know, that could be for the Grand Slam, and and those guys who are just coming back from COVID, it could have a big bearing on on how that result goes. Yeah, and even though they're athletes, so you never know, and a lot of us don't know, I suppose the effects that it has on your body and how you how you recover for that as well. And um, before we let you go, Scott, how is your injury coming on? You're currently injured. Um, how did you get it, and and how's the rehab been? Uh, yeah, it's coming good. Thanks. Uh, did it in the Christmas derbies, so it's been uh, about eight weeks now. So just uh, uh, trying to get the strength back up in my shoulder, fractured my scap, so I uh, wasn't been able to do much for about six weeks just to let it heal. And then, um, like I said, now I'm doing some strength work to get that back and hopefully be back on the field in about four or five weeks. That's great to hear and best of luck with the recovery. Th Scott, thank you so much for coming on and thank you to everybody for watching and listening here today. A big thank you to producer Pat, Paul, Dermot, Anthony and everyone that has helped in getting this show together. This has been House of Rugby Ireland here on Joe Slongafoe. House of Rugby Ireland here on Joe. Game changed. <laughs>